So, you know, friends, uh, today we have uh, with us uh, Swami Narasimhan Nandaji, uh, who is uh, currently the editor of uh, Prabhupada Bharat, which as you know is a, a monthly brought out in uh, English language. And uh, this uh, magazine has a old history. It was uh, started by Swami Vivekananda in 1896. And uh, some of you, you may have seen, it carries very thought-provoking articles uh, which uh, look at different aspects of our uh, uh, civilization and also present day reality. And uh, I think the important, a few issues that I have seen uh, is very knowledgeable. A lot of our uh, young people and why by young people, even others, are not familiar with the different aspects of our civilization and culture. So I think this fills a very important uh, gap. Uh, Swamiji is uh, uh, also a uh, speaker, a, uh, delivers lectures and uh, last year I think we had some discussions also. Yes. Here, uh, he also participated in uh, one of our programs. Uh, we've been discussing something about uh, translation yes, yes. of some manuscripts from Sanskrit into English. We identified one, but we, the other person who was a mathematician, uh -huh. he backed out. So no, but that's going on. That's going on. Aapne uh -huh. Chalye. That's going on. So that's very good. Leelavati. Uh -huh. Leelavati, yeah. So uh, he works on uh, several issues and besides, uh, this is of philosophy, social sciences, religion, Indian studies. Uh, he has uh, edited a volume of uh, Swami Vivekananda's teachings and this volume is titled Vivekananda Reader. I think I should uh, get hold of this. And uh, he writes in English, Hindi, Bengali, Tamil and Malayalam and is currently working on English translation of uh, Suraj Siddhi and Maitrayani Upanishad and collaborates with various academics in formulating an Indian framework of religious studies, comparative religions and sociology, sociology of religion. Last year he made this point that we must institute the religious studies in our universities, which is very, very important. Uh, and in that, not only different religions should be studied, but comparative religions also, I think, is uh, then only we will have a proper understanding of uh, our culture and also we'll be able to see where we stand on the various uh, issues. And I think what he's saying uh, tallies with our own uh, uh, effort uh, in the uh, Vivekananda International Foundation uh, to identify some themes uh, in our ancient resources which we can uh, uh, use uh, in the context of uh, contemporary world's problems and see how we can uh, resolve them. And these themes should be discussed widely even by people of other religion and then we should come up with something which uh, is acceptable to everyone and yet it appeals to everyone because it's coming from your own experience. So I think uh, these kind of studies are very important. So thank you very much for uh, finding time to uh, uh, come to the VIF. And uh, today uh, Swamiji will be speaking on Hindu studies in India and abroad, problems and uh, prospects. I also uh, want to welcome Ambassador Shashank, who is uh, our former uh, Foreign Secretary, and he's also been helping us uh, with uh, uh, some work that we are doing here. Uh, uh, Vasudev Kutumbukam, we have set up a small group here mm -hmm. to look at India's uh, soft power, mm -hmm. and in which culture is very important. So he has uh, also a lot of experience uh, working abroad. I think uh, this is something uh, he can also contribute. And Dr. Ashok Pradhan, who is the Director of the Bharat uh, uh, Vidya Bhavan, and uh, it's been in this field for many, many years. Uh, and they are doing some great work and they also come up with some excellent uh, uh, books. And maybe he'll talk about it uh, during the Q&A. And many other, Professor Dilip Chakravarti, who teaches, you know him. Uh, he's a professor emeritus. And uh, we have just uh, a few months ago released uh, volume uh, six and seven of our ancient uh, uh, India history uh, series. And he is the... Uh, editor. editor of that. So he w visits us uh, during the winters and uh, in fact we are having a book discussion on one of his books uh, uh, next uh, week. 
So, uh, without further ado, I request you to kindly address us. Thank you, Gupta ji, and uh, my greetings to all of you. Namaste. Now, this problem uh, or this issue of Hindu studies in India and abroad, problems and prospects. Now, just now, Gupta ji was mentioning about uh, how to bring about the soft power of India. So, uh, first I will uh, tell you what is now the current status of Hindu studies, both in this country and abroad. As far as uh, outside India is concerned, Hindu studies largely, when we talk about Hindu studies, there are two kinds of scholars. One are those who are traditional scholars, who have been brought up in a particular cultural lineage or a scholarly lineage, who practice some rituals or uh, follow some kind of a lifestyle and they have a thorough understanding of the text and also its practices of Hinduism. So there are many like that. But most of them, the bulk of such scholars live in India and they are not trained in first English language. They are not trained. I know of many scholars who consider it almost blasphemy to speak of these things in English language. So they make it a point that we will talk only in Sanskrit and or we will talk in Pali, but we will never speak in English. And even those who know English language, they don't know a language or the idiom which can be understood by even people of India. Because bulk of our education, as we know, is in a different framework altogether. We have been brought up in a different paradigm. So for us to understand what a particular ancient text is telling, we need to be told that in the language or in the idiom which we understand. And that is why most of us don't have this traditional gift. So that is a big challenge. And when we talk about books that are available in the language which we can understand, most of us can understand only English because that is how we have been taught, that is how we have been brought up where scholarship or intelligence is equivalent to knowledge of English. So if someone talks to you in Hindi, that person is an idiot or the same thing with all vernaculars. So we go to a bookshop and we buy a book which is written in English and which is published by either Oxford, Cambridge, etc. And for most of us who cannot afford such books, which are exorbitantly costly, we go to Munshira Manoharlal or Motilal Banarsidas, who go to these universities and get Indian reprint rights. So basically, we are reading books or we are studying books which are written by people who have taken out the scholarship out of context. So somebody talks about Mimamsa, in the entire life that person has no clue what an Agni Hotra sacrifices, but has written tomes in excellent English with complete references and has done an extraordinary work of scholarship, which our Pandit who practices Agni Hotra Homa every day knows much more than what anyone can imagine, but cannot come out with such a scholarship. So this to, uh, you see, there is this dualistic problem where we have scholarship of Hindu studies by people who have taken it completely out of context. And that is why we have the bigger problem where yoga suddenly becomes non-Hindu and Hindu itself, itself is no religion at all now. And there are so many things like people will say that Tantra is not Hindu. And then anybody can do anything. It is okay if you chant Gayatri Mantra and make it a background score for a Hollywood movie. So the practice, praxis becomes completely diverse from theory. And so this is a problem. But bigger than that problem is a paradigm shift. Because when we are talking about Western philosophy, in Western philosophy, it is not necessary 
that you follow a particular lifestyle or a particular kind of way of life in your day to day life to do philosophy you can do whatever you can have party you can drink you can uh, speak lies you can do whatever it is okay as far as whatever you write reflects your thought that is the basic structure of western philosophy whereas indian philosophy or most of the eastern philosophies don't operate in that manner and so what happened the roman roman greek philosophers philosophers they said that indian philosophy or eastern philosophy is no philosophy at all it is only religion but that's a very convenient way of approaching it because it is not true just like i would give you an example of a mechanic suppose you go to karol bagh here you want to learn uh, how to become a mechanic you will have to be an apprentice to even today to an existing mechanic i'm not suggesting any one of us go there but this is what happens and you have to get beatings you have to get scoldings and then you become a mechanic something of this sort is how a philosopher is trained in the eastern uh, traditions not just in india but elsewhere also so that methodology has been removed now what what is the problem with that the problem with that is because what philosophy we have in india or in the east is so interwoven with life that without this apprenticeship of training just like a management training cannot understand management without an apprenticeship similarly none of the eastern philosophies can can be understood without apprenticeship and it goes much more stronger for the case of hindu studies so you cannot learn for example say um say vaishnavism without having a practical apprenticeship with that so you might have great scholarship of the bhagavata you might have great scholarship of the chaitanya charitamrita but without staying under the tutelage of a particular person who is practicing you will know nothing of vaishnavism and this is exactly the point so hindu studies as hindu studies loses all its meaning without the praxis aspect which is not there in the west so now so now the point is and also there is this ridiculous position suppose consider my own position i am a monk okay so i left my hearth and home after getting this westernized education and doing some work at the age of 23 so even in my home i got some acquired hindu knowledge through practice and some kind of knowledge theory but after that i have been learning this religion both in practice and in theory from people who have been practicing it for like 70 years 80 years but suddenly my knowledge becomes nothing because i don't have a phd from harvard because you know hinduism depends on phd's from harvard so a harvard person writes a book on an aspect of hinduism and if i were to review it and say that see sir you have written very nicely and all your presentation is good but i have only one problem that you have not understood the first thing about the praxis if i say so i am a fool because i don't have a phd from harvard so this becomes a problem so now to prove that i have the authority to even just evaluate i am not just completely you know bashing that person but to evaluate the scholarship that i have an authority that i can validate the scholarship i have a problem because unfortunately hinduism for various historical and other reasons we have failed to produce a certification system like harvard we have failed to do that though we every time claim and boast that we have millennia old history which harvard does not have but we have failed to do that and it becomes very easy in these times to point fingers at people like oh this is because we were under colonial rule it's because we were under slavery okay but we have not been under those things for a long time now but what is the system that we have put in place if i were to ask you 
of which many might be practicing Hindus. If I were to ask a practicing Hindu from the capital of our country, Delhi, to tell me one thing about the religion, they are clueless. But they know more about the Bible and about many other such religions. So this is where the problem is. Because there is no understanding about religious studies. And I don't know why we have a problem built into the system where UGC says that you cannot have any department named religious studies. So recently a scholar, a Swedish scholar who did his uh, PhD from Jadavpur University, he was presenting a seminar on Hindu studies in a university called Adamus University in Barasat, West Bengal, Kolkata. And he said, our problem is that we do not have Hindu studies departments in academia. First of all, we don't have any religious studies department. And there comes the other problem. Now just imagine, see I have no issues against these people. But the problem is, now suddenly authorities on Hinduism are all white skinned people. Okay, they are the authorities of Hinduism. Even organizations who claim to be Hindu organizations, when they want somebody to be on the stage, these people are invited. Now, I have the simple question. It is like uh, calling a person from Japan to make Chole Bhature in Karol Bhag. I don't understand it. I simply don't understand. Is there so much dearth of people who are practicing and who know things? If you go to Kashi, there are people, I will show you Mohallas after Mohallas who speak in chaste Sanskrit even today. Okay, but we will not go there. Why? Because we don't have a medium of communicating. We are perfect when we learn German. There are so many words which cannot be translated. And when somebody uh, learns Heidegger or some other philosopher, we simply use those terms. But the moment I use some terms like Shraddha, I am frowned upon because I don't know English, I don't know how to translate. Same goes for French. So continental philosophy basically has major texts in French and German. But those terms we can use, but we cannot use Indian terms. Where we find more cultural diversity and more religious diversity. So it's not only not logical, it makes no sense. So the prospect should be that there should be a concerted endeavor. When I say concerted, as I said, it is easy to point fingers. But if I were to say that let us take up a text and let us translate, then whoever tells that should do that. If you see, for example, there is a scholar named David Shulman. Now, three years ago, there is a, a imprint of the Harvard University Press called Belknap Press. He brought out a book on the Tamil language. And any scholar of Tamil, if he reads that book, he will commit suicide for the very simple reason that even though he has this scholarship of Tamil, he could not produce one single work like that, of that quality. It is a wonderful book, but David Shulman cannot properly speak Tamil. But he has brought out that book and no, there is, it's a flawless book. So the point is that when, and he has used, when such books come out, their acknowledgement pages, they, it runs into several pages, acknowledgement section. It's a concerted effort. Uh, Oxford came out with a translation of the Rig Veda in three volumes. Those people, two people, they worked, two women, they worked for 25 years on that translation. But because I reviewed it, I understand that most of the things are wrong. But they did it. We don't have one translation to say. Now their question is, okay, we did it wrong, but where is the right translation? We don't have. Because we don't want to do. We, there is no concerted team effort and you get funds to feed cows. If you go to Vrindavan, you get funds to feed monkeys. But you don't get funds 
to do such academic work within Hinduism. Now, my friends, I have many friends among the uh, uh, what you call monks of Christianity. They ask me the simple question that Swamiji, you say that in Hinduism you need funds. What about so many people? There are so many businesses, right? Hindus are not very poor. Why are you not getting funds? And I don't have any answer for that. The same thing if it was a Christian thing, people give funds. Bible projects are all funded, not from outside India, from inside India. There is a huge movement going on within Roman Catholic Christianity to have something called Indian Catholicism. And they call the group Indian Catholic Matters. In fact, there is an e-journal by that name. But we don't have such a concerted effort and we need to have that. So we, what, what, what do we need to do? We need to train our traditional scholars in the modern idiom. In, I have some monastic friends who are very good in Sanskrit cannot use WhatsApp. Now that kind of an attitude is not going to help us in this work. So they have to be trained in the modern tools and also in the modern idiom. And first of all, they have to be identified as part of our work in Ramakrishna Mission Educational and Research Institute. It's a deemed university in Belurmat. We have identified all these scholars and we bring them there and whatever they tell in Sanskrit, we try to translate it and bring out as publication. So this is one important thing. I know that Chinmaya Mission is also doing such work. They are doing, they brought out a, a collection of uh, uh, commentaries, uh, exposition on the first four sutras of the Brahma Sutras. And that was edited by um, Kanshi Ram. He's a great scholar uh, from uh, Delhi University. He used to teach in um, Delhi University. So such efforts have to be done and they have to be translated in a language which can be understood by our youngsters so that they can take an aspect of these studies and do research on that. Now, for example, if somebody has to study the Tantras, unfortunately, we don't have literature available in English language which mirrors the traditional wisdom. So whatever literature is available in the English language says that Tantra means nothing but sex, which is wrong. Why is it so? Because that literature has been written by people of uh, Western universities. And so if we have to counter that or if we have to give a balanced presentation. So another thing is, it is not true that all Western scholars are biased against Hinduism. It's not a truth actually. Many people want to learn Hinduism the proper way, but they don't have texts. They don't have sources. And so having said that, today if somebody has to learn continental philosophy, and if they want to go and tackle the original sources, it is required of them that they should know at least German or French. It is required of them. One cannot claim to be a philosopher of the continental philosophy without knowing German and French. So that person will not have any credibility. But the same is not true with Indian philosophy. A person might not know Sanskrit yet pose as a, in our Indian universities, we have Indian philosophy. We do have Indian philosophy, but most of the professors don't know the first thing about the text. They all read translations. So this is another problem. The Sanskrit language, see I studied in central school, Kendra Vidyalaya. We had no problem with Tattvam, Pushan, Apavrunu. Now I don't know why suddenly this has become a problem. We had all across uh, Kendra Vidyalaya, mainly armed forces dependents. My father was in the Indian Air Force. So, Mm, we had Christians, we have Muslims, everybody. We did not have any problem with that. So this, you know, de-Hinduizing or, or saffronizing or Hinduizing Sanskrit is a big problem. And how many of us know that Sanskrit and then suddenly Sanskrit becomes a dead language, which is not true again. Now, even today, Sanskrit has 
newspapers, daily newspapers, Sanskrit has novels, Sanskrit has short stories and so much of work is being generated in Sanskrit but where is the publicity, why don't we know that? So much of philosophical work is being generated and also in Indian philosophy, people from India, Indian philosophers, they have done a lot of work on Indian philosophy. So that is also part of Hindu studies. You see, some this is the general prevalent idea that Shankaracharya came, then Ramanujacharya came, Madhvacharya came. So some people came, they did some blah, blah, blah. Later, probably Swami Vivekananda came and now nothing is happening on Hindu studies. It's not true. Indian philosophers and scholars are working on Hindu studies, but there is no propagation or no publicity. These things are not taught to philosopher. So, an a guide, say Delhi University. Delhi University has an Indian philosophy, means there are people for Indian philosophy. Um, but if somebody approaches that guide, that sir or madam, I will do, uh, say, a, a thesis on G.R. Malkani, who was a great Indian philosopher. Most people don't even remember the name of G.R. Malkani. Then that madam will be, no, 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 do Wittgenstein. Because it is fashionable to say Wittgenstein, you don't understand the first thing about Wittgenstein's philosophy, but still it's fashionable to say, Kuch bhi angreji naam hai, so videshi naam hai. So that kind of attitude has caused us so much problem that now we have lost text. Brajendranath Seal, who was a classmate of Swami Vivekananda, was a wonderful philosopher, a polymath, but we have lost his works. Now such undertakings should be done. Philosophizing is still going on, but we need to bring those people and say that Hindu studies is not something dead, it's not something archaic, it is still going on. There are people who practice Sri Vidya Upasana. How to codify that, how to bring it in, uh, in the format which people can understand. If you go to the YouTube and you see, there are uh, you know groups, like there is this place called Macedonia. Okay, now there are groups of people, philosophers, who have made channels in um, YouTube and they discuss obscure philosophers and the views will be like 30 to 23, but they are there. I am sure and confident that if we have such efforts for Indian philosophy, there will be much more response. So that we need to do and we cannot any longer, you know, blame Somebody ki aisa tha, isli aisa ho gaya. this party was there, so this did not happen. That we cannot do anymore because we have not done anything about this. We need to have a, you see what has happened because of Gita Press. Gita Press, even people who used to study uh, scriptures, it is because of Gita Press translations of so many bhashyas and commentaries, which unfortunately most many are not being reprinted now. So those texts, are important, which can be accessible. For example, uh, there was one paper which came to the journal Prabhuda Bharata and it is on yoga philosophy in Sant literature of Maharashtra. And so when I was uh, editing that paper, I suddenly realized that online there is no resource on Tukaram's abhangs. Like Tukaram wrote like some 7000 or more abhangs, but there is no resource. And you see, another thing I will tell you, this movement, now people might have issues with any particular movement, but we should not deny what they have done. ISKCON, for example. Now ISKCON, what has happened is, Hare Krishna movement, it got so much following from the West. So many people converted themselves into Hare Krishna followers. And what did it bring? You type a, the name of any text of Gaudi Vaishnavism, you will get the word by word meaning and commentary online. You will get it. And that is not because of any Indian mind. It's all because of Western mind. And under the aegis of Oxford University, there is a center called Oxford Center for Hindu Studies, which is led and managed by Western people who are followers of ISKCON. So Swamiji used to now and then say that we should learn organization from the United States. But we have failed to learn that. So, you see, just because they came to ISKCON, 
those literatures are available online for anyone to access but still now we don't have sant sahitya and i'm sure most of other things other literature we don't have so this is what we need to do if we need to create a counter discourse for what is prevalent in the anglophone literature in the english literature of hindu studies because otherwise we would not be having any evidence to prove that uh, yoga is definitely hindu then we will have to listen and people will say yoga is not hindu and tantra is not hindu then hinduism is not a religion because on this topic that hinduism is not a religion there are thousands of books thousands of book and they quote swami vivekananda that because swami vivekananda said that hinduism came uh, people who uh, were living on the other side of sindhu so that is why it is proof enough that there was no religion by name of hinduism to begin with so how an argument should be presented how a book should be written how a scholarship should be promulgated this systematic study and systematic uh, thing which has been done for example in the case of marxism has to be done and if we don't do that i don't think i don't know how it will happen and to to do it on a sustainable manner we need to have academic departments focused on hindu studies and we should not be apologetical about it because you take any university say princeton university yale university harvard university they have full fledged departments on christian studies on islamic studies and of course on hindu studies princeton has a huge department on hindu studies columbia has a huge department on hindu studies and obscure buddhist texts written in tibetan are being translated so the western mind has some advantage we need to know that and we need to kind of create a bridge between that idiom and the shastric idiom which we have in uh, uh, our country in west bengal or in say gujarat in maharashtra or in kashi uttar pradesh and also uh, down south there are so many uh, traditions which i am afraid are getting lost because uh, some of we are becoming increasingly polarized so somebody says that tamil should not be translated because the original flavor is lost of course it is lost but unless it is translated people will not even know that there is a text like that so all this for example there is the huge text called uh, uh, which is a vaishnavist vaishnavite text like 4000 or 5000 songs written in praise of lord vishnu in tamil but you will not find one single commentary of that text in english and they are all available in tamil and most of them in classical tamil which today no tamilian can understand so these all these uh, problems are a part of this bigger problem of hindu studies and so hindu studies basically the problem is that hindus have done nothing about it that is the problem and if we don't do then of course it's a you know this is a very what you say, uh, what can we say this is a very uh, uh, vibrant field with lot of scope so if we hindus don't do anything about it then other people will do and get all the credit not one quotable english translation of the rigveda is by a hindu and all of them are wrong but then that is what we do ye to galat hai but where is our translation where is the right translation and now the western universities they have got fed up with the western paradigm of religion so there are actually big books on the western construction of religion so they want to get more diversity so in, even i was surprised when somebody approaches for example there is this huge uh, network of social sciences online since 1992 when the internet was just in its nascent stage and is called hnet and there any indian going there and trying to uh, present uh, their scholars scholarship or work they simply uh accept them not only just accept them they are so encouraging because diversity is what they want they are tired of anglophonic or english centric wisdom they are tired of christian or judeo abrahamic centric uh, knowledge 
so they want diversity but unfortunately again there are very few hindus or very few indians who are there because nobody wants to work so hard work is what we need now for hindu studies and i think that was the vision of swami vivekananda but uh, unfortunately we are unable to do that we don't get people to work in uh, you know team spirit and that we need to do i think i have spoken a lot so if we can have some interaction it will be nice <laughs>